We are going to deal with the subject of technology that determines the achievement of food security and poverty alleviation. Uh, as you know, these two subjects are interrelated. In fact, all the SDGs, when you look at them, are interrelated in one way or another, be it health, food security, poverty alleviation, and uh, diseases, and so on. So uh, we, we have, when we deal with one subject, in fact, we are dealing with a subject which has impact on various other sectors. For this afternoon session, we have five speakers, and I'll call upon them to join me on the stage. Professor Timothy Maeta Niamu from Kenya. Professor Kabore Donachian from Burkina Faso. Professor Abu Bakar Siddique Ndoy from Senegal. Is he? Okay, he will join us in a few minutes, I understand. Uh, Dr. Abraham Adu Giamfi from Ghana. And Dr. Kingsley Chu from Cameroon. Please. I must say from the start that we are 20 minutes late, because if you look at your program, we were supposed to start at 10 to 2. And uh, so I will ask uh, all the presenters to be on time. You have 20 minutes, including question time. So you try. It may be of a challenge to you as well. But uh, I, in fact, that's the only way. Because according to the program, we are going to finish at 6. And if each one of you take about 10 minutes, so we'll not finish before dinner. Uh, I'll call upon um, uh, Professor Timothy Maito Niamu from Kenya uh, to make his presentation. Professor Niamu has got a PhD from the University of London, and he has been Professor of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Nairobi, for the past 21 years, or 22 years. The floor is yours. Okay, let me take this opportunity also want to thank the Ghana Academic Sciences for the invitation and also for hosting us and my mother and other colleagues. Now, so far we have been uh, hearing a lot about food security from the point of view of crops. So we may... Yeah, we are asking now is that the dual must have a role in food security? I'm also here to bring another dimension of the Yes, we are also thinking about marginalized group pastoralists. Perhaps we may hear their own story. So this is the dimension that we really want to go. So the title of the presentation is Functions Influencing Camo Production and the Food Security and the Poverty Alleviation in uh, one of the in Masabi North District in Kenya. So we are trying to introduce this neglected animal, the so-called uh, camo, which actually does well uh, in the uh, arid and semi-arid parts. That's my name and my uh, contact uh, is down the email to ufbi.ac and, and .ke. Now, the next slide, uh, we just want to go to, because of the time, I just want to go to the where the introduction. This is just um, 
just want to go straight to the introduction days. There's a picture of a camel somewhere there. Yes. So this is the animal that we are talking about. Uh, the yeah, so this is the animal that we are thinking about, an animal that does well in uh, arid and dry areas of the world. And you notice the type of camel we have in Kenya and many parts of Africa is the one which has got one hump. This is a, a very hardy and survives in many dry areas, uh, we believe it's very high condition. Also notice adaptation, notice the height. So this animal then uh, is able now to browse or reach uh, traps where other animals cannot feed on, particularly the dry season, among other adaptations. So this is the animal that, the other thing also, the environment where they survive in the parts of Africa and the world, um, this uh, dromedaria, camels, one half, uh, these are the type of environment. You notice know, that there is a little bit of vegetation, and it is dry, very um, limited feed, and also water. Now, um, we we'll go very quickly because as we are told by the chairman, these camels are really hard animals, and they are yard in dry areas uh, of the and uh, sorry, uh, in dry areas of and uh, they con uh, which constitute about three percent of the wild service, where there is inadequate feed and also water, and other animals cannot survive well in this very dry condition. A bit of statistics there, there are 23 million camels in the world, and Africa has got 11 million camels, uh, which are mainly in the dry area. Uh, they are of great importance uh, to the people who, survive, who are living in these areas, uh, because they provide milk. Also milk, throughout even if it's very dry period, uh, the camels are also uh, providing the... Yes, let's use this. Okay. Thank you, Tudi. Okay. Sorry. I can hold it. Okay. I hope at least you are communicating now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are talking about 11 million camels in, uh, in Africa and they have great importance uh, because uh, they provide meat. Milk, uh, they provide meat, milk, hydra skins, and transport. Indeed, in Kenya, uh, there's uh, milk, uh, they are referred to as uh, uh, you know, white gold. The compound mass are referred to the white gold, which is also available even when it's uh, very dry, uh, they are able to have milk. Now, uh, they also uh, provide transport. And this is why, in most cases, in many parts of the world, they are referred to as. Uh, uh, desert, tip of the desert, because it's the only main means of transport or in this area. So they provide drought power in this uh, particular area. And um, so they, 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 they contribute to the improvement of income, uh, food security of the communities uh, which live in this area. Uh, in Kenya, we have got one million camels, uh, which are the 80% of these arid and dry uh, areas. And they produce 10% of the total milk production uh, in the country. And uh, although these animals are quite important, and uh, particularly to the community living, pastoral living in arid and uh, semi arid areas, they have.
focusing on this part of Kenya, which is northern part of Kenya, Ambasabit County, which is just border Ethiopia, northern part of Kenya. And in that uh, county, we have got 69,000 camels, which are reared by pastoralists. And they also have got as adjustment to the media consent there, uh, which are uh, interfering with the meat and milk production of these animals. Also, there's quite a lot of things we don't understand about this animal. And there are quite a bit of challenges that there are, for example, the type of variables of diseases and so on and so on, because they are limited information. Also, there are frequent reports in the kind of books, mass media and so on, about uh, death and drought causing deaths, uh, diseases which are not yet known, insecurity, just like in Arasu, so all these problems are still there. Another one, a decent one, is this issue, whereby you open another go here with my colleagues, uh, there are animals, camels dying suddenly, and then the cause of the deaths were not really known. This would find us have mentioned down here, of my, uh, our colleagues, uh, that 115 camels dying within one week, Another week also that the seven camels died, and so many of them showing uh, signs of toxicity. So one of my colleagues there, uh, we um, they try to go and check what is going on there, we're talking about this aspect. So we are this apart from the normal diseases in the environment, these animals are also dying from other 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 poisoning, particularly in the dry season when there is limited water, they go to take this water from the dams or boreholes, uh, it is seen there's a high concentration of toxicants and that this animal die and there's a sudden die, a death of these uh, of, of these uh, animals. Now uh, also we have been mentioning about this disease but uh, here in the fever in many parts of Africa uh, particularly a cause is that we don't take it affect human beings also transmitted by mosquitoes and uh, we have been mentioning about it uh, later on and also very common are during uh, the dry season. Indeed, this is a, a disease of concern to the World Health Organization, uh, because not only in Kenya, but many parts of the world where it occurs, uh, because it affects humans, uh, it's a zoonotic disease. And um, so wherever it is, it's reported that the World Health Organization, you can see in 2018, uh, they're still monitoring in Kenya when there was a report of this, of this disease. Uh, all these are the diseases, the poisoning, the parasites, they cause a decrease in camel uh, production, meat and milk production. And also the illness of the camels and death in the camels. And the other, we are talk, talking about the genetic aspect of the human because they are threat to the human uh, health. Uh, the other one is that this now, which now bordering Ethiopia they are, we call it um, Masabit North District. Actually, just the, the one of the Kenya border in Ethiopia. Uh, this one also very dry, inadequate water, the pastures. And uh, the community that live here is uh, the Gabro pastoralists, and they provide as a means of arrival to the pastoralists after selling meat, milk, and high and leather. Uh, we know that uh, the, this, this community mainly keeps camels, and then about 90 percent uh, are camels and 10 percent of what they back to go. So it was a good idea to study because mainly uh, they're just having the, uh, the camels. We know that the, one of the challenges in this particular area, the population of the camels is growing very slowly for a long time. There have been inter interventions being made by the government and non-government organizations but in despite these success, the population of the camels in this area have been good, uh, growing very, very, very slowly. Uh, there are various constraints. I've just in this, I'm highlighted this insecurity, marketing, diseases. Uh, but we are all that we are seeing this it has a potential producing more camels, but uh, quite a bit of things are not yet done. Uh, so that actually can contribute to the growth of the population, contribute to the income, and food security among pastoralists uh, in this uh, district. Uh, that's what we are seeing, the, the justification of why the research should be done so that we get data, because there is uh, limited data in this particular area. And so the main objectives are, give, uh, are given here, uh, to assess factor influence <coughs> among couple pastoralists in order to establish influence of the breeds of camels, uh, extension uh, 
extraction services, um, and so on. So the, the extraction services, diseases, among the uh, and so on. So the, the, the loss that will be obtained, are, these loss are useful to the government, uh, non-government organization, uh, camel farmers, researchers, and, and so on. Now, the next one uh, is actually quickly, I'll quickly go through the methodology. These are standard methods uh, which are used by this type of studies. I'll uh, quickly highlight them. Uh, first of all, the age of study is Masabit North. I have a figure there. Uh, Masabit North. And uh, sorry, uh, that, that's Masabit North District. And uh, this is Africa, this is where the Kenya is. Uh, now, in the map of Kenya, it shows where the the, the, uh, the Mosabit County is. And also, for your attention here, the, most of this part down this way, this is what we call the arid and semi arid of Kenya. And that's where the, we got our camels. Uh, that's where they are really kept. So, this one, the uh, Mosabit North, uh, is actually located here. The, uh, of, of the, of the, the uh, disk we are talking about. And the study design is that the scheme survey design was used to collect data, and um, uh, uh, these ones are there according to Mogeda and Mogeda. It's a suite of method uh, for data collection. The target population was uh, 990 uh, Gabura Kamo herders from those three locations, and uh, uh, justification: ninety percent of the people are keep camels for their rifle food, and ten percent keep uh, the other animals, cattle keep at goats. And sampling procedure: use random sampling procedure, uh, and then uh, included in the sample are the pastoralists, uh, the extension workers, camel traders, and so on. The data was collected uh, randomly. Data correction. Uh, questionnaires who are used for data collection and also uh, interview schedules, uh, particularly also from the DSIS of annual reports and, and validated rituals conducted in order to ensure accuracy and consistency of the data obtained. By the thing also was done uh, in a neighboring uh, location. Data analysis done using statistical package for uh, soldier science version 21 and of course, as many as statistical parameters are obtained. The other one we have here is the ethical consideration. This of forward, uh, we got the various permits, authorization, and uh, we also got uh, various uh, requirements. But we followed ethical consideration, confidentiality, and so on. So the results uh, quickly. Uh, we have the response rate uh, was very good according to Mugenda, 99%. So that is the, the, uh, the response was very good. Now, now the other one is ownership, the first uh, um, media for the ownership of camels and the hand signs. Uh, all that we are saying, most of the camel 8 percent they own, they own the camels. And this is an important source of rifle food for this community uh, who are pastorists. Uh, the hand size, they are all interested on the, on the hand size. And uh, you notice that uh, majority of the Gabra community, they keep one to 10 camels, to 1%. You also notice that the people who keep more than 40 camels, they are only 5.4% of the camel herders. So that is the so you can see majority of them are keeping less than ten camels. And the other thing we are also interested in what type of breed these people are keep because that's a relationship on the milk production and meat production. And uh, it was shown that fifty one percent of the pastoralists kept indigenous gabra uh, breed which has raw milk production and meat production. But 9.6% reared the Somali camel breed, which also is being introduced in that area, has more milk, higher body weight, and the red breed also, which is also like the first one. Uh, and then that's why we are noticing due to various intervention, the Gabra community now are, are keeping the Somali, try to keep the uh, Somali camel breed, because it produces more milk, 
and body weight. So that one, of course, is contributing to the body, uh, to the food uh, security. And the reason why they are keeping these breeds, uh, the major re one of the reasons, uh, major one, uh, we notice because of transport. And that's why I mentioned this is the uh, uh, desert chip, the 8.1. The other major reason is because of the milk production and so on. Also, they keep them for various cultural uh, type of practices and so on, as indicated there. So then on the next slide, we are about to be interested on the uh, extension services. And uh, one observation, 92% like of who are not trained on camel husbandry. And it was only 7.4% of the rest who had received training on camel keeping in the Masabit North District. And uh, we are just seeing the few who had that had elementary information on the uh, diseases and disease control and so on. Uh, so there is limited uh, uh, information on camel management. About the frequency of the training, uh, we are seeing that 72% uh, uh, had received uh, training only once in a year. And the majority of the camel herders are not up to date information on modern camel husbandry. Last the majority of the uh, of the camel herders are not uh, reported that they are not trained. I receive training many from the non NGOs, government officers, and so on and so on. So let us now quickly come on diseases. There are very many. These are interfering with the uh, with the production, and we are noticing various categories bacterial diseases. Uh, we are noticing that there are there are these uh, bacterial diseases there. And uh, I don't know why it's not moving anyway. So we are seeing that there are those uh, common diseases which are just yeah. So mainly they are bacterial, as we can see there. They are protozoa diseases, and uh, also they are they are parasites. And uh, bacterial diseases we have just mentioned there, which are affecting various systems. And uh, we are, the majority of them, they are followed by the protozoa disease, like trypanosomiasis, this is a sleeping sickness of sura in camels. And those are causes immaturation and also milk production, and is caused by a trypanosoma efansi. And uh, we control technological use of uh, trypanocidal drugs, like sulamine, and so on, to control uh, this uh, disease. Uh, we also have got uh, other viral diseases, the uh, of camelpox and the Duvalet viva, which I meant is zoonotic, is affecting humans and uh, also affected skin and, and parapox uh, virus are uh, also occurring there. And uh, so the other one is perhaps the other one, uh, these are the parasites, which are the ones which occur in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, these are worms, uh, they are the commonest ones which are interfering with the camel production and milk production and loss of weight. Uh, ticks are the major common ectoparasites in the camels and uh, they also reduce milk production. And uh, as we go on, uh, they are quite they are controlled by using various uh, chemicals, the so called caricides, uh, suitable uh, in the camels, according to migrated at chicken and two of these six, are also reproductive diseases. And these ones are important because they interfere with the production of, of milk and uh, there are many of them. The other thing is about, we notice there's a seasonal, seasonal variation of diseases. Uh, we notice that uh, during wet season we've got off at the worms, uh, off at, at the home during the wet season and cowpox during the dry season, trypanosomiasis occurred throughout the year. Uh, poisoning is what we just mentioned. Uh, it is also uh, it's increasing in these areas, particularly the dry season. And uh, these studies also are showing that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a that more research is needed. And even Morgan uh, Swar 205, they notice the poisonous plant there, which are also causing the death of the camels uh, in this area. Uh, in this area. Now, um, uh, the other point here is the about treatment. We know that 80 percent of the camel herders treat animals because conventional drugs and veterinary services are not available. 
and uh, they use the herbal medicine because they are cheap and it available. And that is only that percent of the respondents uh, who use conventional drug to treat camels. And of course, uh, we have just mentioned about the other group of the who are locally available, commit animal health, uh, which are supporting the better department. So we are saying various strategies to be used to control the camel diseases, as suggested earlier on by Maito and Kinyua in 2015. And uh, we are just now coming to conclusion. Uh, chair, um, the, um, the results, the 40 conclusions were made from the study. Uh, the Gabra, first of all, uh, mostly a Gabra breed of camel, which is less productive as far as milk is production and meat, meat is concerned. But now they are still changing to the high yield, uh, the Somali breed of camels. However, there are cultural practices here to change this, uh, the hard dance uh, to from this uh, small one to the big one because it's a, 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 a cultural attachment uh, to the camels. Uh, most of the cabra camel herders keep less than 10 camels and uh, they also face challenge of inadequate pasture and water during the dry periods of the year. Quadri. The results show that bacteria, uh, protozoa, uh, viral diseases, worms and ectoparasites affect camel production health and those cause death of camels, uh, food insecurity and poverty among Gabra pastoralists. It was concluded that most of the camel herders treat sick animals and sick camels by using of course uh, traditional drugs uh, to treat their camels and there are few exception officers in the dis and there are several charities which heed the exception activities and there's a need to improve disease control programs and also train uh, camel farmers and community animal health workers on various aspects of camel management, control of diseases, parasites, and poisoning uh, in the camels. Uh, finally, I want to thank you to various people who have supported us in one way or the other. Uh, you also know management, stand from uh, various uh, support, the was various support. Respondent will provide this useful information on camels. Now that is dry condition, hard conditions. Department of Veterans Services for the information they provided in campus. Finally, also acknowledge um, the Academy of Science, Africa Academy of Sciences, and also my colleagues for this. Thank you very much and God bless you. Yeah, that's what we yeah, it's okay. You can try it. I don't want to take a few comments or questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kiyomu. And uh, what I intend doing is to have three presentations and then we can take questions from the floor. And uh, so the second um, person who is presenting is Dr. Kabore Dunache from Burkina Faso is going to talk about improvement in the quality, the processing, preserving technique, and the diversification of meat and meat products in Burkina Faso. Uh, Dr. Kabore is a senior researcher in biochemistry and microbiology. And um, he has occupied many important uh, posts uh, in microbiology, microbiology laboratory and many other institutions in Burkina Faso. Dr. Kaburi. Okay. I thank you, Chairman. I thank you, Chairman. My name is uh, Kaburi Dunasne. I'm a researcher uh, in uh, Institute of Research uh, in Burkina Faso. Uh, so I'm pleased uh, to present uh, you on the topic. Anyway, I think that I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, I can begin. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. 
So the topic uh, is uh, on the improvement of this quality, processing technologies, and diversification of meat and meat products in Burkina Faso. Uh, so uh, Burkina Faso has a potentiality in terms of uh, breeding. We produce uh, a lot of meat. We eat uh, a lot of meat. But what is the quality of uh, these uh, meat and meat products? It's too what is described in my uh, introduction. Uh, here we have donc, uh, the presentation of our laboratory, our institution. Uh, so the content of my presentation are focused on the introduction, objective, material and method, result, conclusion and the recommendation. But as we gain, we, we need to, to have time, uh, will uh, uh, go straight on the, the follow on the following of my presentation. The objective, the general objective of uh, this work is to increase the add value of the livestock meat sector to the improvement of meat product quality in Burkina Faso. And the specific objective are to review the current status of the application of good hygienic practices in meat gear to assess the contamination level of sheep gray offal, beef and sheep meat, to appreciate the microbiological quality of sheep gray offal, beef and sheep meat according to the microbiological standard, to analyze the impact of the equipment we develop called Caligri on the quality of gray meat, to formulate or develop a new meat product incorporating local ingredients and uh, condiments. Alors, what is the material and method we use? About the survey on the application of good hygienic practice in meat gruyere, uh, a survey was conducted in the 55 sectors of Ouagadougou among gruyere. The purpose of the survey was to assess the condition under which meet our process. This survey was conducted using an established form. About the microbiological quality of sheep gray offal, beef and sheep meat, 40 beef meat sample, 120 sheep meat sample, and 20 sheep gray offal sample were collected from meat gray in Ouagadougou, packaged in sterile steel polyethylene bag, and transport to the laboratory in a cooler containing melting ice. The sample were prepared and analyzed for total count, enterobacteria C, yeast and mold, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, Campylobacter, Brisella, Bacillus cereus, Salmonella. About the impact of the quality gray oven on the quality of gray meat, this activity carried out in order to respond to health content and inappropriate meat processing equipment. Caligre is an oven using the wood as combustible developed by our institute, IRSAT. And here we have uh, the equipment. Uh, and uh, here in the second photo, we have the traditional gray. And uh, down we have uh, the fresh beef meat and the gray meat from a traditional oven and the gray meat from Cali Gray. The sample were prepared for oh sorry. About the impact of Cali Gray oven on the quality of gray, 
to assess the impact of caligre on grey meat, 200 grams of fresh beef meat, 200 grams of grey meat from caligre, and 200 grams of meat grey by the traditional method were collected in freezer bag for microbiological, biochemical, and sensory analysis according to the following table. Fresh meat was analyzed for total microorganisms, yeast and mold, enterobacteria, pH, mossy, H content, protein content, lipid. The traditional gray meat and the gray meat from Cali Gray were analyzed for total microorganisms, yeast and mold, enterobacteria, pH, mossy, H content, protein content, lipid content, and sensory analysis. The statistical analysis were performed using XLSTAT 2018 and the interpretation of microbiological quality was done according to the microbiological criteria in log CCU according to uh, this uh, table. Dear Chairman, what are the results we obtain? About the survey on the application of good hygienic practice in meat gruyere, the result of the survey on the application of good hygienic practice in meat gruyere revealed that 47% of meat came from the refrigerator slaughterhouse, 36% from market, 14% from butcher shop, and 17% from other non-conventional slaughterhouse. The meat is kept outdoor before grilling, which exposes it to dust and flies, which are the main sources of contamination. And 10% of grillers use a freezer or refrigerator to store the rest of the meat after grilling. Tap water is used to wash the equipment and material and is stored in cans or buckets left open. This could therefore be a source of contamination of the product and affect its, its hygienic quality. About the ingredient use, those used before grilling are not washed and those used after grilling are not protected. About the personal hygiene, 5% of Gria had complaints uh, under injuries and cold. 67% uh, wear protective clothing. 47% uh, have uh, unwashing facilities. About the hygiene of the room, 46% uh, carry out their activities in areas exposed to dust and 54% in a less exposed area. About the cleaning and frequency, the cleaning of the equipment is done with detergent, not followed by disinfection. Cleaning personnel have not received any training on the doors to be respected. The finished product, 90% of beer cook the meat for 10 and 15 minutes. Only 10% of beer cook the meat for 20 minutes. 53% of grillers use aluminum foil to serve gray meat. 41% use plastic bag. 1% table lotus and 5% cement paper. About the production chain, two types of grid of grill with and without protection were observed and only 1% of grillers use the gray with protection. About the microbiological quality of beef and sheep meat and grey offal, the contamination level of beef and sheep meat and grey offal sold in Ouagadougou. This study assessed the microbiological quality of beef and sheep meat and grey offal sold in Ouagadougou. The following figure show the result obtained, expressed in log. Bristella was not detected in any sample. All the germ salts were found at varied concentration 
in the sample analyzed, regardless of the meat nature. The majority of fresh and green meat samples contain germs that exceed acceptable limit by established standards. Whatever the parameter analyzed, fresh meat is more contaminated than grey meat. Grey offal is the less contaminated product. Analysis of the conformity of the microbiological quality of meat product regarding to microbiological standard. About the percentage of beef meat compliance, the majority of fresh beef presented satisfactory concentration in Brucella and Pseudomonas. However, the concentration in total microorganisms, Enterobacteria, Campylobacter, Staphylococcus, Bacillus cereus, are not satisfactory, as shown in the, the, this table. About the sheep meat compliance, the majority of sheep fresh meat show unsatisfactory concentration in total microorganisms. Enterobacteria, Campylobacter, Bacillus cereus, Staphylococcus, although they did not contain any Brucella and Pseudomonas. And while the majority uh, of uh, sheep grey meat show satisfactory quality in yeast and mould, Enterobacteria, Brucella, and Pseudomonas, they were not compliant for Campylobacteria, ba Bacillus cereus, and Staphylococcus. About the percentage of grey offal compliance, the grey offal in majority were satisfactory as shown in this figure in blue color. Let's say that the origin of the contamination of our sample could be fecal or cross-fecal, environmental or due to a lack of hygiene of the material and equipment used or insufficient cooking of the meat, no compliance of good slaughter practice, the cold chain. The presence of these germ could be a source of, a contamina of toxin infection or food poisoning or before a source and therefore a source of health problems for consumers. About the impact of the quality, the new equipment of the, the quality ON on the quality of green meat, the result uh, of uh, biochemical and microbiological analysis of fresh and green meat using the traditional process and the improved process are recorded in the following table. And we notice that the traditional grey meat show higher average protein and H value than grey meat from Caligre ON. However, the lipid concentration of grey meat from Caligre were higher than those of traditional grey meat. The results obtained in microbiology show that graying improves the quality of gray meat, whatever the process used, traditional or improved. This could be explained by the effect of heat that destroy microorganisms. The result of sensory analysis of fresh and gray meat using the traditional process and the improved process are recorded in the following table. And uh, you, we notice that the use of quality improves the appearance, color, and smell of green meat compared to the traditional ON. And we notice that 50% uh, of testers prefer quality grey meat. Dear Chairman, what is the conclusion and the recommendation? The present work reveals that meat processor do not respect the good hygienic practice. The results show that beef and sheep meat and mostly contaminate, are mostly contaminated to levels that are not acceptable according to established microbiological standards, whereas sheep grey offal are mostly satisfactory. In addition, the present study showed that Cali grey has a positive impact on the nutritional, hygienic, and sensory quality of gray meat. In view of uh, the result uh, obtained, we recommend the use of Cali gray oven by meat grayer. In order to improve the quality of meat product, so as uh, to offer a safer product to consumers, recommendations are needed. 
sensitization of all actors involved in the transformation process, hygiene of the room and equipment use and personal and closing hygiene, hygiene of uh, working condition, respect for the cold chain in the conservation of the raw material before greening, hygiene in the storage of green meat and in the service to consumer. The next step concerns the formulation, the development of uh, new meat products, incorporating local ingredients and condiments such as sumbala, moringa, instead of a chemical additive. Assessment of the nutritional safety and sensory quality of a product formulate. Carrying out a packaging and a preservation test on meat product in order to determine the shelf life. And the dissemination of all technologies to stakeholders uh, through training and demonstration session and the support for the adoption of this technology. Uh, to finish, I would like to thank WAP. WAP is West Africa Agricultural Productivity Program. I would like also to thank the National Research Center, CNRST. I would like to thank my institution, ISTAS, IRSAT. And I would like to thank also Ghana Academy of Art and Science. And thank you for your attention. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabore. Uh, so we'll have a third uh, presentation uh, before um, moving on to questions. Uh, the next presentation is by Professor Ndoy from Senegal and uh, he's going to talk to us about the importance of post-harvest technology and achievement on food security and poverty alleviation. I think ITA is very well known, in fact I had known your previous director, director uh, Dr. Osman Khan for a very, very long time, and, and, and I know for sure, because I have been there many times, that ETR in Senegal does an extremely good job. So, the floor is yours. Th thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, so, uh, this is my title, Importance of the post harvest Technology on Achievement of Food Security and Poverty Alleviation. I will going to talk about some success story and academy initiative. This is my presentation outline uh, and a brief introduction. I go to the example of success story, the academy initiative, and some concluding remarks. As you know that Senegal has a big program we call Plan Senegal Emergent, and uh, priority in this program, one of them is uh, on uh, agricultural and uh, agro-food industries. Senegal also is focusing on the, all, the all the sustainable development goals, particularly the, the second one, and anger, achieve food security, improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. The other objective also of the Ministry in charge of the agriculture is what we call Program for Accelerated Agricultural Development, it's called PRACAS, which really uh, take into account one important thing, this, the post-harvest technology. Uh, we sometimes when we code about food security, uh, people talk about increase the production. This is not enough. I do think that post service loss, post service technology is very important. What we notice also are the traditional technology often is not very performant. So we need really 
very performant, appropriate post-harvest technology. We need also post-harvest technology to add that value to, pro to our local agricultural product. And also, uh, it's important uh, to bring farmers on the processing area to have uh, value added on their own production. So, uh, I go to my second part of the presentation, the some success story. And I start with cereals. Why cereals? Because, as you know, in the Sahelian, 60% uh, of the energy is coming from cereals. So, cereals is very important. That's why uh, in my country for pearl minerals, sorghum, maize, we have many programs. Uh, there is a, the WAP, the West African Productivity Program. The PAFA is a support program for value, uh, food value chain. This is a pader also for entrepreneurship in the rural areas. And the program d'urgence of the development communautaire is a program specific for the rural areas with the significant contribution to the development of these local cereals. What we can do through these programs, technology are available, research has been done. A consequence of this is a growing community of small food processors, composed mainly with women. Now we have a high quality processed product in the market and also a very increasing demand of processed food, especially for the uh, our uh, the diaspora. Uh, we uh, have here an equipment locally made uh, because, as you know, women used to use the pestle and the mortar. Now you have a locally made pressure, very uh, appropriate to reduce post harvest loss and work also to have a high quality grain. And nowadays, uh, you have uh, in the market, even in the small shop or the supermarket, now you can find out already processed uh, local cereals. Here you have, uh, sorry, here you have uh, frozen granulated millet, here you have dried processed uh, products. We also, uh, I don't know, maybe many African countries are eating a lot of bread. We have tried to see how we can uh, use part of our local cereal to put it in the bread. And uh, with the program of the West African Productivity Program, we have uh, developed some uh, uh, plant to produce the composite flour uh, for bread making. And here you have uh, uh, the uh, composite flour bread, uh, we call pain dole, is the, is the term. Dole is uh, uh, strength. And uh, we see the, in, the, in our calculation, if we really do the extension of this bread uh, produced by 20 bakeries, 200 bakeries, uh, the turnover will be about 104 billion CFA for private. This is the revenue, very important. Also, regarding the cereals, uh, we have moved on new product. Uh, somebody has talked this morning about how to mix uh, milk and cereal. We are very complementary, you know, that uh, cereal has a lysine deficiency. Uh, it leads it with the milk. You have this product locally called chakari, who is now available in the supermarket. Uh, in, uh, uh, we call it chakri. Another achievement we have is uh, uh, at what time we have a loss of uh, uh, mangoes uh, production 
And uh, sorry. And what we have uh, tried to do is just to develop very appropriate technology to process it into dry mango, and also some very appropriate equipment, which is now popularized. Then, so then we can limit the loss on this uh, production. What also we have done is that there is some variety of mangoes is not uh, what we call very fibrous, you know, not uh, interesting for uh, eating. Uh, but it's very sweet, uh, this, sorry. I'm sorry. But it's very sweet. Yeah. So you can, uh, from this uh, variety of mango, you can, you can uh, prepare uh, vinegar using uh, Orleans method. And we have, uh, with some women in association in the south of the country, in Casamas, developed a technology, very simple. It is a uh, alcoholic fermentation and acetic fermentation. A very uh, easy method uh, transferred to the women to prepare the mango vinegar. For uh, some uh, uh, baobab fruit, which is uh, uh, the ginger, the tamarind, the bisap, sorry. The bisap is the hibiscus. Uh, we have tried to introduce the a specific technology of uh, atomization. Uh, we developed it, and now there is a it transfer uh, to a company in Senegal who is uh, doing this kind of product who is an uh, instant uh, powder from uh, baobab, from bisap, sorry, from bisap, gingem, and some other products. And now uh, these products are available in the market. Even for those who are traveling, when you go to our new airport, you can find this product in the lobby. This is another uh, success story. Uh, you know that Senegal is producing a lot of uh, peanut. And uh, sorry, the problem of the peanut is uh, that uh, if it's processed by the in the rural areas, you you have problem of aflatoxin. Now the problem is uh, how we can eliminate this aflatoxin for this oil produced in the rural areas. We come out with a very simple technique. Uh, the oil was prepared by uh, in the rural areas. When you mix it with clay, we have a local clay we call atapilgit. When you mix it and uh, you do the filtration, you, you have an oil free of uh, aflatoxin. And what is interesting that uh, farmers who are now producing uh, peanut can create a valued value because uh, our government has made an arrangement that this oil produced in the, by the farmers can be now uh, uh, bought by the big enterprise to have a very refined oil. So it's a, a kind of revenue who is uh, just uh, interesting for the farmers, the uh, value added. So, uh, I come to the, this is just some example. I come to the uh, Academy Initiative. Uh, this is a mission of the Academy, I just give there. But the, the, the thing is, is, which is very important, what is the achievement of the Academy? Our academy is, uh, has conducted many studies from the President of the Republic to request and from our own initiative to give public authorities recommendation on a particular issue of national interest. From this study conducted, uh, academy, our academy don't have an university, we don't have an institute, but we work closely with university and research center we produce report and uh, we have report on the, the land in Senegal situation 
and perspective for the modernization of agriculture. You have, empl the, you have employment opportunities in agriculture in Senegal. The saline oil rehabilitation uh, in Senegal for the benefit of agriculture. A five volume document on science education for mat from maternal to high education. A genetical modified organism, situation, challenge and per perception in Senegal. And every year, uh, with our solemn ceremony with the president, we give him the, the reports. And uh, I could say that he implemented muscle. Also, uh, our academy has signed an MOU with the Lindau Foundation, giving every year young postdoc student opportunity to meet with Nobel Laureate Prize in Germany. We have a joint project with uh, Valonia Brussels International on the development of science and technology education. We have also a joint program on uh, Macrobian biotechnology with Asande Academy of Science and Technique in Morocco. This is uh, my concluding remarks. Uh, just uh, we just noticed the importance of promoting science and technology education, real basis for sustainable development. We do all agree on that. Importance of support to real entrepreneurs due to the care role on food and nutrition security using local agricultural products. Importance to work with them for cost and price reduction in order to significantly enlarge their market. Importance for the rural entrepreneurs to get facility on the basic production entrance, energy, sugar packaging. Somebody talked about that this morning. Importance of training programs, especially for women and home economists. Behind the approach based on food starting from production, diversification, processing, and marketing of food a sustainable strategy for food security and poverty alleviation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Ndoy from Senegal about the method for uh, clay filtration of oil. If you have something published or uh, I need more information about that, because we have a big problem with monofilotoxin in Sudan and we need to apply different methods for those. Thank you. Also for Professor Ndoy, um, that's a fascinating and very broad presentation. I wonder if you have any um, indications, any success in, in terms of numerically uh, jobs created or, or numbers of enterprises or anything. It's, it's quite interesting.
No, I would want to Professor uh, Nyangu on the camera production. I think there is a need for a slight modification of the title, and I would rather discuss it with him when we finish. Questions and then we can ask for a second round of questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Suleiman, for your question. Uh, just, uh, I think that uh, for the aflatoxin, we just, the equipment you, uh, I show here, has uh, two parts. The first part is uh, the mixing facilities, where you mix the crude oil with the clay. We have uh, uh, locally a uh, clay. We have locally uh, in Senegal what we call atapiljit. Uh, it's the clay uh, where you have many types of clay. Uh, and after this mixing, you just uh, leave uh, for little minutes. Uh, mixing this oil with uh, clay the fixation of the of the aflatoxin by the clay. After when you do the filtration, uh, the oil is But uh, the, this is uh, an equipment we have developed in the, as the president said, in the, in the Institute of Food Technology. And uh, the, our national uh, uh, fund for research, agricultural research and agro-food research, has uh, done the extension. Uh, and uh, we have uh, more than 200 women association dealing with that. We have also private who be involved on that because uh, uh, our former Minister of Agriculture, uh, uh, Dr. Pablaisek, has uh, negotiated with uh, big companies to buy this wheel, to this oil, in order to put. Nowadays, uh, sometime in the past, it was difficult to find out in the market peanut oil because uh, the cost is very interesting. It was in exported, but nowadays in the supermarket, the peanut oil is uh, again available. Yes. Uh, just a supplementary question to what uh, you said. Um, how did you identify the clay that uh, is appropriate for that? Did it, did it, uh, uh, did you do some experiment or just... Uh... You know that is well known because in the United States uh, the aflatic problem is uh, real. Uh, they use, uh, there is a publication using the bentonite. Bentonite is a kind of clay. And from this work uh, we have uh, tried to see if locally we have a clay which be, could be suitable, and research has been done on that. This is a starting point. We didn't start from scratch. Uh, exactly. 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 For uh, rural entrepreneurs, uh, that's why uh, all the research we have done in the Institute of Food Technology, uh, we have tried to see how we can give facilities to women association 
or even private to have business around this outcome we have. I couldn't tell you how much uh, uh, enterprise is created from that, but uh, the statistic uh, could be uh, fine out on that, because nowadays you have many uh, agri-food business processing local uh, agricultural product. If you are interested, I can maybe send you some reports on, on that. Huh? Uh, and what is important is that uh, uh, it was difficult in the past that those uh, small medium enterprise uh, have their product in the supermarket, the, the modern supermarket. But with the Auchan, you know Auchan is French, uh, uh, supermarket who is now uh, in Senegal. Uh, they really work closely with the small medium enterprise processing local agricultural product. And population are very happy to see that uh, their uh, local product are processed and product available in the very modern uh, presentation. Thank you. And there was one question on Kamel. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are open and uh, any comments are uh, quite welcome. Indeed, there's quite a lot of uh, details. This was um, to sensitize members. There's quite a lot of uh, things that we are seeing in uh, campus in this uh, dry area. In order to help the pastors or the people who are there, they need attention. They have been neglected. And even you can see there's quite a lot of death of these animals. We don't even know in some cases what's causing the death of these animals. There are diseases which are also appearing, and they are following those diseases which are causing sudden death. So there's quite a lot of things. Even this uh, plant which are invading these uh, areas, uh, Duriflora, or of course, Duriflora, coming and uh, displacing the uh, the pastures and uh, so and quite a lot of so and also they are poisoning the animals. So there's quite a lot of this in this uh, ecology that we if we are going to help the common uh, farmers. So we are really open to any suggestion now we just we can mention also this just uh, part one another of other data we will be presenting later. We are just presenting the first uh, report of, of the of the findings. We got others uh, which also be presenting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have time for about two more questions in case there are any. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm Professor Malan from Côte d'Ivoire. I would like to congratulate all the speakers. My question is uh, directed to my brother Kabore. He talked about uh, contamination, microbiological contamination for meats. We did uh, the same study, not almost the same study, but one important question now is that to um, make those food to create meats, the people or, or fish or everything, the people use rubber tree. And the rubber tree, with the smoke of the rubber tree, we have some concert products like uh, benzopyrene. And I, I hope that somebody knows those products. And I think that next time, we have to check also what is the influence of charcoal, rubber, and what, which uh, wood the people use to grade their, their meat. It's an important uh, question, I think. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor uh, Niamu. 
I don't see the valorization of the camel, the valorization, uh, for instance, the best chocolate is coming from the camel. I don't see these things. So the best chocolate is coming from the milk of the camel. So I don't see these kind of things because you need to valorize. It is not enough to produce. You need to valorize. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your suggestion above, about uh, the use of uh, other local product uh, to see uh, if we can uh, conserve uh, the meat product. And after this is the first uh, step of our study, and uh, this study showed that uh, our product, our meat product, are contaminated. Uh, so as I show on my pictures, the next step uh, is uh, to make uh, some, uh, to develop uh, some product and to make uh, some formulation uh, using uh, other product and uh, you give uh, some example. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh, we will try it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there was one more question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank the, <coughs> the, 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 that, uh, the, the person who asked about the question on the chocolate and so on, and quickly mentioned that um, um, there is an attempt to improve what we call the value addition, value addition of caramel milk. So there are various processes, right from fermentation, and pasteurization and so on. So we are having uh, more products, yogurt, and, and so on, which are being now uh, produced. So this is uh, uh, just one aspect. In fact, in yogurt, they're adding uh, various vitamins, uh, strawberry, vanilla, and uh, quite a lot of, of them uh, to increase value addition for the farmers so that they can fetch a more, uh, more money for the products. So the idea is how do you preserve this uh, milk coming from the very dry areas, poor infrastructure to the urban areas. So one of them is to try to have uh, solar uh, refrigerators or trunks with, uh, which are refrigerated. And from there, then when they go to the factory, you are able now to do a value addition, whether you want to process a, a yogurt or whether you want to add, depending on the prefer and the market you need. Another point I might uh, <coughs> mention, there is a high demand now of the common milk following research, showing that um, it's very important from point of view nutrition and also medicinal aspect. There is a report uh, tried to show that the common milk is very rich in the minerals like iron, three times that of cow, and it has got low fat content and uh, can be used for treatment of the lifestyle diseases. So there's quite a lot of demand in the world market uh, for this camel because of it is reputed to have quite a bit of mezzanine value and nutrition, particularly in these communities which are in these uh, dry areas. So young children and so on, they need iron. They need uh, these uh, <coughs> antibodies for prevention of diseases. So I think that we need also to keep on interacting. And also those people in the food science, there are a lot of products that can be made and it becomes surprised uh, to the population so that we can control, uh, we can get, uh, um, we can add uh, value to this milk and also help the communities to generate more income and to also reduce uh, uh, um, of food insecurity and also alleviate poverty. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So what we are going to do now is to take the two other speakers for this afternoon. And um, then you will have a chance to ask questions, not only to, the, uh, to our two friends here, but also to all the others who have made presentations this afternoon. So uh, the next speaker there is um, 
Dr. Abraham Giamfi. Um, he's from Gaek, I, I guess. Uh, yes, you are from Gaek, and maybe he's too young to remember me when I used to go there on a fairly regular basis. And also, I know about this radiation uh, facility for uh, uh, f uh, radiation technology for food preservation. Okay, so um, Dr. Gianfi, I said he's from Ghana Atomic Energy uh, Commission, but more specifically, he deals with that radiation facility, I understand, um, which is a gamma irradiation facility using cobalt 60 or cesium 137? Cobalt 60. Okay, the floor is yours. An opportunity to present to you uh, certain ideas and information on radiation technology for food preservation and shelf life extension. I am currently with the School of Nuclear and Allied Sciences. Uh, I joined the place this year, and I used to be the manager for the radiation facility at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Yeah, my presentation will uh, capture uh, essential aspects of the history of uh, the technology, the facilities and radiation that are used, the advantages of the technology, applications, current status in Africa, global development and trends, then challenges and recommendations, and I'll conclude by making some important notes. Over 100 years ago, we had a discovery of the X-rays, and uh, I think five years after that, there was a filing of patent for the traction of parasites in uh, food in the U.S. and the U.K. And uh, between that time and the uh, 1950s, there was a stall in the development of the technology because large cobalt sources were not readily available. But the U.S. Army uh, initiated the National Food Radiation Program, which actually spared on development of the technology with uh, the radiation of spices in Germany, the first commercial radiation of spices in Germany. Then the approval by the US FDA also gave impetus. Then in 1981, a very important milestone, uh, okay, when the International Expert uh, Committee published uh, the wholesomeness of irradiated foods. That really laid the ground for further acceleration of the technology. The radiation basically within the electromagnetic spectrum. And there are several radiations, but the ones which are of importance. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. The ones which are of importance happen to be those with a short wavelength, and high energy, very high frequency, X-rays, gamma rays, are the ones which are currently used in processing our food. So we have X-rays, fast electrons, or what we call electron beams, then we have gamma rays. These are the radiations which are employed in the processing of our food. And the mechanism of radiation damage is said that these radiations are different from the others because they are ionized. They have a lot of energy, and with that energy, they can knock off electrons from atoms. And in so doing, create ions which become radicals, and these radicals are very reactive. And, uh, can bring about radiation damage, and uh, principally the damage usually is in the uh, DNA and other vital organelles of the, the cell, and uh, this will lead to uh, cell death in most cases, and about 90% of the damage, DNA damage, is caused by the uh, breaking of water molecules leading to the formation of free radicals, which then bring about a lot of the damage in cells. The radiations which are used in uh, processing food come from different sources. And basically, we have radioactive sources or radioisotopes. Then we also have the machine sources, the electron beam uh, machines, then the X-ray machines. And these sources are very important. For example, if we take the cobalt 60 source, which is the very, very common one that is used, they have a half-life of about 5.3 years. That of cesium is about 30 years. 
then the energy levels are very, very important. The energy levels are low, and therefore they can be applied in processing food. For the gamma rays, the energy level is about 1.7 to about 1.33 uh, mega electron volts, and that for cesium is far less. Then when we come to the machine sources, machine sources, because these don't rely on radioisotopes to generate radiations. They are machines which can be turned on, then when that is done, the radiations will be released. So we have the electron beam machines, we have the X-ray uh, machines. And these rely on power, which is variable. Then also, the energy levels of these are such that they are regulated, as we can see on the board. Then the penetration is also critical. The X-rays can penetrate further in water or in tissues, whilst the electron beam penetration is very much restricted. Gamma rays do penetrate deeper in materials. So we have various facilities which can generate these radiations. And we have the electron beam uh, irradiator. An example is the one shown, as you can see from this one. Sorry. We have, these are the products which receive the radiations from scan horn, which we can see over here. Then we have, these are the model for the X radiator. And as we know, X-rays are generated when fast electrons strike certain metallic objects leading to the release of these radiations, as we can see here. So the products will be placed in this part to receive the radiation. Then we have the gamma radiator, which is very common and the most widely used. And basically what we see, we normally have the radiation source either in a container or in some cases in a pool of water and the mechanism for bringing it out. These are the products in the radiation room and the process occurs here. Then we usually have shielding to contain the radiation that is generated by these uh, facilities. Most importantly, we also have laboratory scale radiators. And these are the ones which are needed to start any national program in radiation uh, processing. We can get X-ray machines, uh, we can get gamma radiators and electron beam uh, facilities. These are laboratory scale and can be placed in any room for research work. It is from these research work that we can have scale to the commercial uh, application of the facility. They are very, very essential. Of late, we also have mobile radiators. And these are in certain countries but these are for the machine sources. You cannot get uh, mobile uh, radioisotopes because movement of mobile uh, radioisotopes is very much regulated. But for the machine sources, we have these mobile facilities in other countries where they can be applied for other purposes, the uh, cleaning up uh, wastewater from most chemical industries can be done using these facilities. So the choice of source can be based on a number of factors. The product that we want to work on, the type of product, the density, the throughput, how much product we want to process per unit time, the dose that we want to apply, the dwell time, the conveyor speed of the facility. For these sources, it's also important to know that we have their comparative strength and we have their comparative weaknesses. For the cobalt or for the radioisotopes, they are usually versatile. They can be easily managed in terms of the facility. They can be applied to large package products. They have high penetration. They are easy to maintain, relatively cheap, and they, they consume less energy, and they are not so capital intensive. In terms of their weaknesses, the radioactive handling and management is an issue for cobalt and cesium the low energy intensity, the replenishment of the source is also another issue. When the source strength goes down, you have to replenish. And it's not so easy getting these uh, materials from other countries. The line system is tightly regulated. We have limited supplies, and there's a lot of public concern con uh, concerning their use. For the, <coughs> for the uh, electron beam, the, the strengths are in the fact that there are no radioactive source. It is just a machine which can be put on and off, depending on when we, 
we don't need to replenish it. We can get high intensity, and it is less tightly regulated. But of course, there are weaknesses in the sense that the radiations are limited in, in their penetration, and large sizes cannot be easily processed. They also have high capital intensive uh, uh, resources to start them, and they rely on electricity, which is quite on the high side. So you need a lot of power to be able to generate these radiations. For the X-rays, they also have high power to generate them, but they are also limited by the uh, low efficiency of their conversion because of the large amount of energy you need, but they have high penetration and they are also very good in terms of efficiency in processing products. So all these are important, but finally the dose that can be uh, delivered in a product is based on a number of parameters. The most important is the exposure time for the radiation. And this exposure time can be determined by the speed of the conveyor, which also may depend on other parameters like the strength of the source, the density of the product, and the power of the electron beam and, or the uh, X-ray machine and so forth. Yeah. So as a technology, we usually try to place it alongside others. Radiation technology is not the only one that can be used in processing food. But then there are certain unique advantages which you always want to highlight in that it is a cold process. It doesn't lead to any change in the temperature. Uh, it doesn't lead to any Oh, sorry. It doesn't lead to any changes that will bring about residues in the food. It allows products to be treated in the final package. There is no nutritional loss, and the sensory quality of food is maintained when we, we use the technology. Okay. But of course, like any other technology, there are limitations in its application. The technology cannot destroy toxins or viruses and the doses that are used in decontaminating food. It cannot also guard against recontamination of food because there are no residues left behind. The mechanism is due to the energy of the radiation. Okay? So we usually will want to caution that it is not the ultimate solution for all problems related to foods, but rather must be applied as part of a total sanitation program. But then the safety has been an issue of applying this technology. But there's a lot of evidence that has been generated over the years on the safety of the technology through the assessment of chemical compounds formed by the irradiation, the study of any uh, carcinogenic or mutagenic or genetic effects on animals fed with irradiated food. There is also a lot of experience over 40 years with uh, laboratory animals consuming irradiated foods for tens of generations. Then studies on humans have also been done in several countries. Then we have over 40 years of commercialization of this uh, technology. So all these led to the endorsement by vital organizations in the international arena. The most important of which is the joint WHO, FAO, and the IEA committee on irradiated food, which concluded that food irradiation is thoroughly, is a thoroughly tested process, and when established guidelines and procedures are followed, it can help ensure a safer and more plentiful supply of food. Other international bodies have all endorsed this process. So the application of the technology is vital to us all. And it is important that we recognize that over half the food that is produced globally is lost or wasted. And just as the Green Revolution was used uh, by science or use science to feed the hungry world, it is imperative that we once again look at the science, specifically radiation technology to prevent a global food crisis. So using the technology, we can process food and contribute to food security through one, preservation, and two, shelf life extension. For preservation, 
we can get a number of objectives, eliminating pathogens and parasites from food. We can also decontaminate food by just reducing the spoilage microbes. Then we can also undertake this infestation of food. Then with sprout inhibition, we seek to extend the shelf life of certain foods. Then we can delay ripening and senescence of fruits. So in our quest to eliminate pathogens and parasites using radiation, I think we are all aware of the burden of foodborne diseases. According to the WHO, we lose almost about 420,000 lives per year from this. In Africa, this is even greater. Almost about a third of life lost to foodborne diseases is in Africa. And the issue of globalization has even compounded this problem. Food produced in countries very far off may be consumed within a very short time. We now have bacteria, enteric viruses, we have biofilms, we have internalized pathogens, and they're all creating problems with food safety. But it's been established that radiation doses of one to seven kilograms can easily eliminate from food these pathogens thus ensuring the preservation of these foods. Then also, we can undertake the contamination of foods by reducing the spoilage of uh, the food. And this, we can use a dose of 10 to 50 kilograms. Here, the essence is to reduce the microbial load so that the food can have a better standard and we can consume the food without it going uh, bad. This is done with a lot of spices, with a lot of food additives and uh, food ingredients. For this infestation, it is vital. Across the world, we lose a lot of food due to action of plant pests. Almost about 10 to 16 percent of food is lost. And this creates a huge challenge for all of us. Insect pets do create a lot of damage, most in cereals, then also in fruits and uh, vegetables. It's been established that doses as low as one kilogram can destroy insects in foods. And this is being applied on a large scale. It is very important to also know that this application has quarantine importance. Most fruits and vegetables that are produced, oh, sorry. most fruits and vegetables that are produced from certain countries end up in other countries. And there's always a challenge of ensuring that insects of quarantine importance are not transported along with them. But of course, there are some concerns with some of the alternatives alternative methods that are used in controlling uh, insects. So radiation comes in very good because it avoids the use of chemical fumigants which have environmental and health concerns. Sprout inhibition is also another area where we can apply the technology and this leads to saving of so much food across the world. We lose a lot of root tuber and combs as a result of Pusave's uh, challenges. And using radiation, we can really reduce this. Sprouting of roots and tubers, usually during storage, prevents the long-term storage of these products. And this process also causes moisture loss, dry matter loss, tissue degradation, and also loss of palatability of the food. Very low doses of radiation usually around 0.15 kilogram, can ensure sprout inhibition by inhibiting cell division and elongation in these plants also. It is important to also mention that the same process of uh, sprout inhibition can also lead to uh, increased rotting in certain uh, roots and tubers because the mechanism of wound healing is also impeded by the action of radiation. So curing of yams 
procuring of these products before their process is very essential, since it leads to healing of these wounds. Okay. Delay of ripening of sunny also is another area of application. Fruit and vegetables through their growth period undergo ripening and aging. And this can be prevented when we use radiation. And very low doses can be used to ensure that fruits do not ripen quickly and they also don't age as fast as will happen under natural conditions. I want to quickly look at some issues on the global sea, which are very critical to application of the technology for the purpose of food preservation as well as uh, shelf life extension. Currently, the global food irradiation market is valued at almost about $2 million uh, in 217. And this is projected to grow at about 5% uh, per annum to about 284 in 2026. But then we see that there is consumption of irradiated food across the group. In 2016, over 200, over 800,000 tons were consumed. And China is now the main area where a lot of these activities are concerned. Africa, as you can see here, is very, very, very small. We are not making use of the technology. So in Africa, we have South Africa, Egypt, and Ghana using the technology uh, currently to a higher degree. And these countries started their programs in the 60s and 70s. Currently, we have South Africa, Egypt, Ghana, Tunisia, Morocco employing the technology on a commercial scale. South Africa has almost about four irradiation facilities and processes spices and fruits and vegetables for local market and export. Egypt has about two, and uh, this is used for spices and uh, vegetables. As we can see with the global or regional distribution, Africa is about 4% of the global uh, number of these irradiation facilities, which is very, very low. So countries like Ghana, Tunisia, Morocco have a commercial facility each for processing food and other medical items. Uh, Nigeria, Algeria, Ethiopia have facilities which are yet to be exploited commercially. Other countries with interest in the technology are currently implementing technical cooperation programs or projects with the International Atomic Energy Agency under the AFRA framework. The Radiation Technology Center in Ghana has a radiation facility which was installed in 1994 and upgraded in 2010. This facility is used in processing food and uh, medical items. So currently, within the country, entrepreneurs can access this facility to process food either for the local market or to export these food to other countries. One important development which occurred in the, in the international arena is the approval by the US uh, Food and Drugs Administration of phytosanitary treatment of fresh fruits and vegetables by radiation. This approval uh, has led to several countries also giving approval for the technology, especially in Asia, America, and Oceania. And there is increased consumer acceptance of the technology across a lot of uh, countries. So globally, the trade of produce irradiated for phytosanitary purposes is increasing. And as can be seen here, the U.S. is a big market for these products. From Asia, we are getting products being transported to the U.S., from Australia to the uh, Southeast Asia, then also to other countries, New Zealand. South Africa is very important in this. There are a lot of fruits moving from South Africa to the U.S. Mexico is very close to the U.S. and also taking advantage of this uh, technology. So globally, since 1995, there has been rapid increase in volumes of irradiated produce for cytophanitary uh, purposes. And this market is growing now, and I think Africa needs to take advantage of this. The 
USA uh, started the framework equivalency work plans uh, some few years ago, and this is an agreement that they have with countries to uh, trade in irradiated products. So US can certify uh, facilities in those countries to process uh, fresh produce for export to the US, and the US can also process uh, produce and send to these countries. And it's been done with these countries. So as we speak now, all these countries are exporting products that have been irradiated to the US under these uh, work plans. And it's hoped that Africa will take advantage of this too. In the European Union, there is a different story. Since 1999, directives on food irradiation limited the use of the technology. Permitted only spices and herbs to be irradiated. Uh, you have two more minutes. And the directive has been challenged as not science-based. The directive is undergoing revision since 2017. It's hoped that Europe will be repositioned to fully embrace the technology. There are other emerging trends. New machines are being formed, and most of these new machines are machines which are using low energy and they are using reduced power to make the process more efficient. So the challenges to be applying the technology are numerous. First, we have lack of public education, low level of stakeholder awareness, low commitment of governments, low private sector participation, absence of detailed feasibility studies where we are transitioning from a facility that is government controlled to a commercial, uh, to a free private facility. Difficulty in obtaining regulative sources and tighter regulation in the post 9-11 world. So in, in recommendations, these are the points that I've raised. The government should be committed to providing infrastructure together with an enabling environment. Commercial feasibility studies should be properly undertaken at appropriate time. Private sector investment is needed to expand utilization. Human resource development is required for training critical amounts of scientists and technologies. Public education is required to promote consumer acceptance of the technology. Stakeholder awareness is relevant for attracting investment and support. Cooperation and collaboration with IAEA is important. Then South-South cooperation should be also uh, uh, encouraged. In conclusion, I will say that radiation technology has been established as an effective tool for improving quality of food and agricultural products. Government should create and sustain an enabling environment for effective utilization of the technology to ensure food security. There is a need for increased collaboration of countries with the IAEA and other international organizations to for formulation and implementation of national projects. Sub-regional regional and international collaboration among countries should be sought to accelerate utilization of the technology for development. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Giamfi. So we have one last presentation before we take more questions. Uh, Dr. Echu, he's a researcher in the animal nutrition and physiology at the Institute of Agricultural Research for Development. That's in um, Cameroon. Uh, Dr. Echu, the floor is yours. And this one just to down. Then this is a pointer. Okay, thank you, Chair. As it goes, I think I'll be making my presentation. Sorry. Okay. So this is the team of the conference, as all of us know, and my presentation falls under sub team two, which is technologies that determine that achieve security and poverty alleviation. So I'll be presenting on the topic, proven technologies that have contributed to food security and poverty alleviation in Cameroon and beyond. So that's a presenter. So the inspiration is actually from Genesis 44 verse 1. 
when Joseph ordered his stewards, saying to them, Fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack, his mouth. So whatever we are doing it here today, it has existed. So we are just adding value to meet up the challenges of the time. That said, this is the outline of my presentation. We'll go about the context and introduction, the definition of food security, Cameroon strategy, as supported by the World Food Program. We'll talk about food security, the suspending of the legal goals, and the realities in Cameroon. We'll talk about policies on food security, the role of the Cameroon Academy of Science, its vision and creation, Iran's creation and mission, objectives of this presentation, the methodology used in developing these technologies, then we'll take, go away to straight to the technologies, which is actually the title of the topic, and the impact of the technology on poverty alleviation. We'll talk about the constraints associated with the use of these technologies, as well as how these constraints can be overcome by looking into the role of the Cameroon Academy of Science, then we'll attempt to make some conclusions. That said, I would like to say Cameroon is uh, actually a bilingual country with a population of about 23 million, and of this, it's made up of about 230 ethnic groups divided into five agroecological zones, which is actually endowed with a lot of minerals, gas, timber, and minerals, and as of the classification that Cameroon is amongst one, the 132 out of 138 countries in human development reports. And of these, we have 65% women who are literate compared to 78 men who are equally literate. However, food insecurity targets regions have 14% of households are headed by women. And of these, 16% are actually food insecured. Talking about the introduction, that 16% of the households are estimated to be food insecured, including 1% that are severely food insecured. And most of these insecure are particularly those of the northern parts of the country, which is actually of three regions, because Cameroon has 10 regions. Three are actually based in the northern part of the country, and we have the far north uh, with its associated figures, Adamawa, and the north. But surprisingly, the interesting, it has been realized that the northwest and the west regions of Cameroon have actually been affected by food insecurity because of the sociopolitical situation in the country, where these two regions have been affected by internally displaced persons, and as such, the pressure on the available food is much. In addition, 22% of the rural houses are food insecure compared to 10% who are insecure in the urban areas. So, like Professor Niobong defined in the morning, food security can actually be defined as having physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preference for an active and healthy life. That's the definition given by FAO in 2018. In 2008, also, food security can be defined as when food supply and demand are sufficient to cover food requirements on a continuous and stable basis. On the other hand, if we can attempt to define food security, then what is food insecurity? It is when there is occasional, repeated, or permanent supply or demands that cannot be met in terms of requirements. Now, food security as defined by the United Nations Committee for World Food Security and FAO defines it in three major areas as food availability, food access, and food use. But James Brandon defined it as security, sovereignty, and safety. But irrespective of the definition, security, food security prevails if both supply and demand are sufficiently covered on a continuous and stable basis. 
while on the other hand, food insecurity prevails at the same time when there is occasional, repeated, or permanent food supply that is not met. Now, let's go to the Cameroon strategic plan as supported by the World Food Program. And this is actually peculiar to the three northern parts of the country where they have access to inadequate and nutritious food during and after the crisis. And also vulnerable households in protected displaced communities at risk in chronically food insecure areas have safe year-round access to adequate and nutritious food and increase their resilience to shocks. Also, from six to nine months, and vulnerable women and men in food insecure priority districts have reduced malnutrition rates in line with national studies standard by 2020. And lastly, food insecure smallholders, especially women in priority districts of Far North, North and Adamawa and Eastern regions, have stability, stably increased incomes to enhance their self-reliance and livelihoods and improve their productivity by 2020. Now, what are the realities of the Sustainable Development Goals when it comes to food security? Actually, I have considered two which are, have direct impact. And here we talk about the Sustainable Development Goal 1, which to, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. What are the strategies the, the government has put in place to meet up with this? We have the first is promotion of food security through increase in water, animal health, improvement of food preservation techniques in the northern, far northern parts of the country because it's with availability of water and improved animal health, water can be used for irrigation to increase crop production, reduction. Animal health, once it is improved, mortality is reduced and preservation also improves the shelf lives of the crops. Then intensification of the activities of demand development partners. Actually, these activities are not carried out in isolation. That is by only Cameroon. We have development partners, so we have to facilitate the environment for them to equally come in and encourage us. The third is to improve the road network so that transportation as well as some of the enclaved areas can be reached with these technologies. Then the elimination of farmlands to reduce the conflicts between agro-pastoralists the establishment of pioneer agricultural and livestock rearing zones, which actually have potentials that are underutilized. Promotion for the industrialization of traditional farming and fishing concerns, and the valorization of cultural wealth in the littoral. Littoral is actually a coastal area noted for a lot of fishing. Now, talking about sustainable development goal two, which talks about end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutritious and promote sustainable agriculture. As per 2015 and 2016 Zero Hunger Strategy Review identified that the requirements for achieving STG2 target include, this actually involves policy and this is the strategy the government has put in place to realize sustainable development goal two. Then talking about the Cameroon policies on food security. Here, the state institutions specifically designed to implement the right to food are actually 17 ministries, and each is structured to handle specific areas. We have production and research, which is carried out by the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Fisheries and Industry, as well as the Ministry of Forestry and Wildlife, then scientific research and innovation. When it comes to marketing, it's done by the Ministry of Trade and Commerce, Labor and Social Welfare is done by Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare, Social Affairs, Women Empowerment and the Family. Then when it comes to Youth Employment and Support Programs, is done by the Ministry of Youth Affairs, Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. For Infrastructure is carried out by the Ministry of Agriculture and Royal Development. So Cameroon Academy of Science. It was actually, it has been created, but it has been existing, but it was actually in 1991 that it was formally recognized by the decree, as we can all see there. And the vision is to be the prime mover of science and technology, making scientific knowledge available to decision and policy makers 
with a view to influencing investment priorities in science and technology and promoting the use of science and innovations in the economic, social, and cultural development of Cameroon. Actually, it does not work in, in isolation. It has its collaborators, for which NAS is a member, as well as the United States National Academy of Science, Academy of Science of the Developing World, Royal Society in London, Network of African Science Academies, Interacademic Panel in the International Issues, and Interacademic Panel and other international and national organizations. So this takes us to the Institute of Agricultural Research, which was actually two different institutions which were existing in isolation, the Institute of Animal Production and the Institute of Crop Production. In 1996, the two were brought together to form the Institute of Agricultural Research for Development, and in 2002, the retail was improved. And actually, his vision is to respond to the needs of agricultural development actors through Cameroon, through our Cameroon, such as providing improved seeds of both crop and livestock. And for it to carry out this mission, it has these six outline objectives promoting global agenda up to often decision tools to policymakers and agricultural entrepreneurs. So the organizational structure of IRAD, why am I laying this uh, emphasis on IRAD? Because this is where the technologies are developed. And this is Cameroon and the five agroecological zones. So this is the first agroecological zone, Sudan of Sahelian. This is the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And the technologies are produced in such a way they are adapted to each agricultural zone to maximize resources available for production. So Iran, as we said, has five scientific coordinations. The first coordination is or department is for annual crops. Annual crops has four programs. The first program is cereals. We have industrial annual crops like cotton. We have root and tuber plants of bananas and we also have leguminous crops. The next is the Department of Perennial Crops, which also runs four programs. Stimulant crops, oil producing crops like oil palm. We have latex, heavier, brasiliensis, which is peculiar, fruits and fruit trees. The third is the Department of Animal Production and Fisheries, which has five programs. We have the program for small ruminants, which is sheep and goat. We have fisheries and aquaculture, monogastric, which is pigs, poultry. We also have large ruminants, cattle, and animal health, which cuts across all. This takes us to forestry and environment, which is the fourth scientific coordination, which is made up of five, four programs. We have forestry and wood, soils, water, and atmosphere, and biodiversity. The, the fifth is socioeconomic, Royal Sociology, which is actually involved with processing and uh, selling of Iran products. So as I said, the objective of this paper is to do what? To highlight the technologies that have been contributing to food security and poverty alleviation in Cameroon, as well as Central Africa, because it's considered that Cameroon is Africa in miniature. And most of these technologies developed by this institute is not only applicable to Cameroon, but also applicable to Central Africa and even parts of West Africa for whom we share longer frontiers with. So how are these technologies developed? They are developed through a bottom-top approach where a multidisciplinary and multi-sectorial team is formed, including farmers, researchers, agri-extension workers, who now have questionnaires they descend to the field to administer these questionnaires to the end users who are farmers, be crop, or livestock production to cover the entire value chain. When these preoccupations are collected from the farmers, they are now synthesized into a report which is validated at the level of the Regional Scientific Commission. Once, and this happens in the five agroecological zones, the various validated reports are now sent to the National Scientific Commission with all the stakeholders to be validated. Once they are validated, a team of experts is now set up to now develop these reports into research teams for a given period. 
and these are considered as research plans, be it for five years. The result, these research plans are now sought for in terms of projects with development partners like NAS, USD, European Union, CORAF, WECAD, to source for funding. The data that is up as results is then brought back to farmers in the form of training workshops, including the extension staff. That's how the technologies are developed. Now, let's go to the... For purpose of covering everything, will equally structure them according to the scientific coordinations. You see, some of these technologies developed, we have tissue culture, which is actually applicable to both plantains, bananas, as you can see some of the samples here, even uh, yam, uh, roots and tubers, we also, which is, we also have proliferation of in bits of fragments, which is peculiar for banana, plantain and cocoa yams. We have genetic improvement in terms of breeding to have high yielding varieties. Some of these varieties have been certified ISO with ORP, which is responsible for certification. And these are the varieties as well as which can be seen here. For annual crops, we have cassava, some whom these are some of the rat products which have been processed. We have maize. So these are some of the developed technologies in terms of annual crops. We also have including genetic improvement in the area of maize, cotton, cocoa, coffee, banana. And these are the high yielding varieties of cassava. Initially, I will call to attention that the local variety of cassava yields about 5 to 10 tons per hectare. But with the improved varieties, we have up to 75 to 80 tons. So we have rice varieties which yield 5 to 9 tons, sorghum varieties, four varieties which yield two to five tons per hectare, cowpea four varieties, common bean, cassava, potatoes, plantains, all these are varieties that are available and they are adapted to each agroecological zone for effective production, high yields and maximum utilization based on the culture of the population. Now for perennial crops, we have technologies like marketing, which is peculiar for guava, safu, that is plum, lemon trees, orange, grapefruits, corosol, then grafting tool like budding is peculiar for hevia, brasilensis, avocado, and name it. These are the products. And genetically improvement in terms of breeding and selection for cocoa and coffee, as we see here, the high yielding varieties. This is marketing for fruit trees where it takes about two to three years to start fruiting, as well as this uh, mango we call it uh, this mango variety is called is actually very heavy and by two to three years it starts fruiting then for the area of animal production and fisheries we have genetic improvement here peculiar is a tool like artificial insemination where semen is collected semen is collected from the cow for insemination of many cows. We also have genetic improvement like crossbreeding for poultry, traditional poultry in particular pigs and rabbits. We have production of pelleted feed to increase efficiency. Then aquaculture also in terms of to meet the demands for fish production. Then production of floatan feed. Those are the better technologies available. Then for small ruminants, we have the rearing of goods off their natural environment, like the use of this improved housing system. And this actually reduces strain of animals and the conflicts between the pastoralists. We equally have characterization of goats and sheep, which have been done all over the country and peculiar for each agroecological zones. We have an inventory of 300 species of fish all over the territory, and this improves the production for each of the five agroecological zones and the techniques of biological pond control. This takes us to animal production. In terms of animal health, we have here, this is a pedal for a food bath where cattle pass to avoid ticks and other associated diseases. Then for the poultry, we have realized that there's a reduction in harsh mortality after the production of the old chicks. Then ethno-veterinary practices 
And there's also aspects of diversification where non-conventional livestock like snails and grass cutters have been introduced so that the common man who cannot meet up with poultry production can be involved with snails or grass cutter production. In the area of forestry and environment is domestication of non-timber forest products through the use of cuttings, and this is peculiar to Okok or Neptu Africanum. In the area of socioeconomics, these are some of the rad products. This is coffee, Iraq coffee. These are some of the produce products. These are the various beans varieties. This is cheese made from sheep and goat. Then in terms of the impact of the technology, I will just we'll have two minutes. Thank you, sir. I will just highlight some of them that in terms of this the impact fish production in Cameroon stands at 400 tons and the country can only produce 180 the remaining has to be imported so through aquaculture fish can be taken care of improve use of seeds like maize there is a 1.4 increase in production and also the exotic breed of chicken now the constraints in the use of this technology for example, is getting this technology across to some of the enclave parts of the country, insufficient funding, inadequate human resources like the early retirement age to researchers, obsolete equipment, inadequate or refresher courses to update the skills of the concern, and other associated challenges like gender and cultural barriers for women to involve in application of form of them. Then the role of the current Academy of Cameroon. The Cameroon Academy of Science is actually structured into three colleges, College of Biological Sciences, Mathematics and Physical Sciences, and Social Sciences. And this, these are some of the activities they carry out. Science advisory, they have publications and lectures, major publications, scientific journals, some workshops, participation in uh, conferences like this, and also they play a liaison role and facilitate policies between the government and some of the research institutions. And in conclusion, I'd like to say Iraq and partners coupled with the natural diversity of human and potentials in Cameroon makes it a safe haven for people to live for a safe food environment. And also the Cameroon Academy of Science has been playing a major role to facilitate and engage the government to policies with all this functioning in full gear and the empowering of Iraq, food security can be ensured in this part of the country. These are the, some of the partners that work with us. And with this, I just wish to say thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ichu. So if you look at the program, we are supposed to finish at 20 past 4. And although we started 20 minutes late, I think we have been able to catch up with time. And we have just five minutes for question to be exactly on time for the next session. So I would ask uh, Dr. Giampi and uh, Dr. Echu to join me and um, to answer some of your questions, queries, concerns. Uh, yes, uh, oh, you, you need that. You can. Okay. Uh, can you introduce yourself just in case some people may not know? Hello. Hello. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Kavwanga Yambayamba from the Zambia Academy of Sciences. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Abraham Adu uh, on um, radiation technology. On the recommendations that uh, you made, uh, you did not indicate um, uh, who would take a lead on those recommendations. So I don't know, how do you think the recommendations would be carried out? And secondly, what is the role of the academies in, in this, um, you know, taking up of uh, this technology in Africa? Thank you.
Okay, thank you. My name is uh, <coughs> Professor Maito from the University of Nairobi. And uh, my question is uh, first of all going to Dr. Abraham Adu. Really, first of all, thank you for that uh, presentation. But this is area is a controversial one. And you can see there you have documented public concern. Now, one of the concerns that we have is at this long term effect mutagenicity. That means genetic material can be DNA and chromosomes can be affected by very small quantities of this uh, of the radiation. Teratogenicity, uh, abnormalities, and you are just dealt with one aspect of casinogenicity. So, uh, uh, this one, uh, this matter being addressed because we know for the large um, primates, humans, and animals, you need very many decades to really tell whether this is having effect on the productive system, gametes, and so on, or even genetic material, DNA, RNAs, and so on, because we have need to go through primates, like from robot animals, monkeys, and so many decades, so that we are able, we are sure, generations, they will not have dimorphities, they will not have, uh, you know, um, mutagenicity, and so on. So what is your view of this uh, public concern? Have they really properly addressed? Or you think, uh, you think there may be some more work? That we, there's a very good technology, but there's your public fear because of this long-term effect. Thank you very much. More question? Uh, So I am uh, Professor Raja Sharkawi from uh, Morocco, the Academy Hassan the Academy of Science and Technology. And uh, my question is for Dr. Abraham uh, from Ghana. Uh, I would like uh, to have more details what techniques you have in Ghana, and uh, if the Academy helps to have that or encourage to have that, the Academy of Science which role they have indeed. But I would like to have more details for uh, techniques you use, you use in, for radiation. Okay, so um, we have three questions. Uh, I would like to add one or two more uh, before I give the floor to the presenters to respond. Uh, of course, you say that uh, irradiated food, uh, there have been lots of studies carried out elsewhere that this food irradiated is safe. And uh, do you have uh, any concern, uh, any sort of um, perception in Ghana that the food, irradiated food, may not be safe? And if so, what are you doing uh, about it? And the same for GMO. I think uh, there's a perception that GMO uh, may have adverse effect on health and so on. Uh, we know as scientists probably that this is not the case, but if there is such a perception, what are you doing about it to reassure the population? Someone. Yeah, my question also goes to Dr. Janfi from the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Um, your facility there is mainly a research facility, but over the years you've tried to use it for commercial purposes, including, for example, uh, irradiation of uh, intravenous infusions manufactured in Coforidia. But how sustainable is the facility for large-scale use? And what plans has the government got to provide large-scale um, centers for 
this technique for food preservation, and not only food preservation, but the intravenous infusion uh, products as well. I, I know that your, your radiation source, your gamma radiation source, for example, recently ran out, and <laughs> getting fresh sources became a problem. Uh, so how sustainable is the, is the project? Yes, I, I will take the first question if um, right. I think it was to do with the recommendations that I, uh, I, I, I made. I think the recommendations emanated from the uh, challenges that I, I listed. And uh, in these recommendations, uh, although I didn't uh, specifically uh, identify uh, the, 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 the who is supposed to be responsible. I think, uh, in general, we have the the, the, the government and uh, being uh, the key uh, uh, stakeholder in uh, ensuring that the technology uh, takes root in the uh, various countries. Um, aside the government, we have the various uh, research institutions. Also, we have the private sector, also we have the associations of uh, various industries, but we realize that the role of government is very uh, paramount in this. If as for the whole technology to even start, if you look at the history of the technology in most regions, it's government institutions, research institutions, which usually have the technology, they go through pilot scale, then eventually they get to a point where the try to get private sector involvement, then it becomes maybe a public uh, private partnership. Then eventually it becomes a, a sort of a, a purely a private uh, uh, facility. So the government is the key stakeholder here, but then the government will be assisted by other stakeholders. I think the private sector is very, very key in this uh, way of ensuring utilization of the technology in various uh, countries. For the other question, which was dealing with public concern, the DNA effects and uh, long-term effects, I think I made it clear that this technology has been one of the most uh, thoroughly investigated technologies ever. I went through the endorsements, which was based on uh, evidence that has been generated over several years. I mentioned uh, long-term studies. If these long-term studies were on um, uh, laboratory animals as well as human subjects were used in long-term studies, not only in one country, but in several countries. And these span a period, a long period, a little over 50 years or even more that data was accumulated for all these studies. Yes, I mentioned the fact that the, the mechanism deals with effects in the DNA. But the, at that level, the, the levels of radiation that are applied are very, very low. And the DNA at that level I was referring to happens with the DNA of the microorganisms parasites and others which may be in the food, not the DNA of the, 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 the food itself. So this is what I was actually uh, trying to explain. The effect is not due to the action of the radioactive substances themselves. It is due to the effect of the energy that is in the radiation field created by these radio uh, isotopes. So that is a very, very big definition. And of course, I kept mentioning the energy levels. The energy levels of the radioisotopes are very, very important. For these facilities, there is line system and regulation. So the, the sources have been carefully selected and the energy levels emitted, energy levels of these various sources, the cobalt cesium and the, the X-rays and the, the electron beams 
how carefully uh, regulated so that we don't get high energy levels which can yeah, lead to these things. So we have regulations, we have uh, standards which are used in uh, processing. So these effects are not existent. There's a perception there in the public, but perception really may not necessarily be based on scientific facts. If you look at the endorsement, all major uh, health regulatory authorities have endorsed the technology. The, the, the third question was on uh, the, let me see. Yeah, what technology is used in Ghana uh, in terms of the uh, food radiation that we do here? I mentioned that we have a radiation technology center at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, and we have been experimenting in this area since the 70s. Into, uh, in 1994, we had a semi-commercial facility that was put up by the Ghana government uh, with assistance from the International <coughs> Atomic Energy Agency. We use it for pilot scale activities. Then in 2010, we upgraded this facility to a full commercial facility, which we have been using for the purposes of processing food items, as well as uh, sterilization of medical items for a lot of hospitals. The technology is the same whether it's being applied in the uh, food sector or it's being applied at the medical uh, sector or even the industrial sector. It is the mechanisms for destruction are the same and it's being used in these areas. The, the fourth question was a uh, uh, whether we have concerns in Ghana which we uh, yeah, GMOs and other concerns in Ghana yeah. I think we through the development of the technology in the country we've been through uh, a trajectory that has seen laboratory scale work uh, pilot scale activities before we go to the commercial scale. During the pilot scale activities, we did a lot of public education and we also did a food fair. We organized food fairs where uh, foods that have been uh, irradiated, raw materials that have been irradiated were used in preparing a lot of local foods where we have uh, the public, we have our taste panelists and so forth, all taking part in this. And there's been a program of trying to educate the, the, the public, periodically engage them on the technology itself. So we are not really concerned about any uh, organized group or any uh, high level of concerns with regard to the technology. Yeah. The, the last one, I think from uh, Prof, the research facility, uh, no, the, the issue of GMOs, the GMOs. Uh, GMOs uh, fall outside the area of uh, radiation uh, technology we are considering. GMOs involve genetic manipulation, and uh, these are deliberate genetic manipulations which are done. But as far as we are concerned with radiation uh, processing, we apply these radiations, and uh, the effects supposed to be uh, on the, the genetic effect, but it's significantly different from the way uh, DNA, uh, GMOs are created. The research facility and uh, sustainability, the research facility and government's plan to upgrade. Yes, we have concerns with the uh, radioisotope. I think I mentioned that our cobalt has a half-life of about 5.3 years. So the quantity that we obtained in 1994 uh, has gone, went through uh, about two half lives and we had to upgrade. So we upgraded this in 2010 with additional cobalt. And now that level is going down. There are plans to upgrade the current uh, uh, facility with additional uh, cobalt. We are working with the International Atomic Energy Agency to and the Ghana government to ensure that 
upgrading of this new facility is done. Certainly, we have problems with uh, our, our, our our operations in terms of the output, because the output is linked to the strength of the source. We plan to get private sector involvement, and we believe that this is what will ensure sustainability of this technology in the country. The government has indicated public-private partnership, and in so doing, the Commission is actively seeking investors to support uh, this area of our activity. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to add anything? Oh, everything has been said. Everything has been said. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, our five presenters have made an excellent job, not only for their very good presentations, but also for having kept the time and uh, they deserve a big round of applause. Uh, so uh, now we have one more item. And as you probably know, most of us should know anyway, that uh, we had a lot, all academies in Africa, of most academies in Africa, and certainly also the network of African science academies, have benefited a tremendous amount from the United States in general, but especially from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are in Amasa today, Amasa 15, but we should remember that Amasa started with Asadi, and Asadi was funded by the Bill Gates Foundation for about 10 years, and um, in that context, we had benefited from, uh, of course, Bill Gates Foundation, but especially from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So today, we are very fortunate to have a representative of AEES and who will talk to us about challenges for international science partnerships. Please. I'm actually going to stay down here. Um, and I'm not going to use any PowerPoint. Because what, I, what we really seek is your input and your assistance in talking about something that is really of grave importance to all of us. Uh, I work f for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, another AAAS, but in this case I'm here to represent the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, the Academy was founded in 1780 uh, and counted among its memberships a lot of what the U.S. calls its founding fathers, and they were fathers, uh, no mothers. Um, <laughs> it was what it was. Um, in this particular case, uh, we understand that whether we are trying to explore the heavens or, or address issues that relate to disease, or food security, or climate change, that we're unlikely to be able to accomplish this without scientific partnership. We understand this. But we really need to get some input from others in the world about the, the place and the opportunity that the United States actually has for international partnership. This project started uh, to look at challenges of international science partnerships, scientific partnerships, and it, it was actually begun by two of my colleagues who are physicists, uh, Arthur Bienenstock and Peter Michelson from Stanford, both from Stanford. 
Um, I was a, was a member, I am a member of the steering group for this project. But when we began to talk, we, began, we started to understand that the physicist's perspective on partnership is often very different from the rest of our perspective on partnership. Oftentimes, their work is dependent on big facilities. CERN, Sesame, I mean, places where you've got to bring countries and scientists together where often you can't even be able to uh, accomplish the goals of the project without the involvement of lots of different partners because of the size of the budget, because of the range of capacities that you need, and so on. But it became clear in our work that that wasn't the only kind of partnership that we really needed to look at. And that we needed to look at partnerships with what we call emerging science partners. Maybe smaller scale, but no less important. So how do we, in fact, nurture and protect and actually work on those kinds of partnerships? So when we are going around talking to people in different regions, we are looking at kind of the following assumptions. One is that we, are, we all share the, the SDGs, but we're unlikely, any of us, to be able to address them without science and technology. We won't be able to achieve them. We can achieve them if we work together, if we can figure out how to share our knowledge, how to bring our networks together in rational ways. We already understand that science and technology are global activities. You know, as though I needed any reminder of that, I walk into a room and I already know about six people but we have met before. We have worked together before through other organizations around different kinds of issues. So if that is the case and we have this global connection already, how do we take advantage of it? And in our case, what do we need to do on the side of the U.S., the side of the United States, to be better partners? to offer better partnership. Another assumption that actually relates to this is we understand the need for enabling conditions. We know that if you don't have the laboratories, the equipment, the, the uh, places to store data, the places to actually address the telecommunications and so on, that, we're, that it's going to be tough, tougher to actually do this work. We also know that in many cases that m many of you have actually been educated in the North. And so we are trying to bring people away from their regions or their countries. We don't want to promote brain drain. But as Muhammad Hassan always talks about, we like the idea of brain circulation and that we don't want to begin to try to pull people out, but we do want to see what may be the opportunities for additional kinds of training and education that can move the ideas more quickly. We have been at, at my employer, AAAS, very active in the region, in the area of science diplomacy. We know that there are all kinds of opportunities that can situate themselves within this area. And we have worked with, with TWAS over the years in terms of trying to promote some of these. So the other major areas that we want to focus on, and we being uh, my co-chair, uh, Fumi Ulupati uh, from the University of Chicago, who works on global health, uh, that we want to focus on is we want to look at young people. We want to figure out how do we get them into these kinds of partnerships and discussions early on. And we especially want to look at gender. We will not address the SDGs without addressing the issue of women. We will not. 
we need the brains, we need the energy, and we need the perspectives. As I was listening to the presentations on food security, for example, I was struck by the fact that at some point, it isn't just about making, crop, making crops available, it's about using them. And it's about having to pass what I described as the kitchen test in terms of being able to actually put some of these things in place. So we, to coming to understand that these are the kinds of, of perspectives that we must uh, integrate. Uh, and uh, additional, in addition to the partnership issues, there's the communication issues. How, in fact, do we talk to the public about the things that we do? Oftentimes there is fear, there is misunderstanding, and so how do we begin to work with and educate the public in ways so that they may be more accepting of some of the things that we're trying to, that we're trying to achieve in the work that we are all doing. We are uh, developing some draft recommendations that we have to test, however, with you. And they are, we're looking at, the, at recommendations to US universities, for example. Many of you have individual partnerships already with people in U.S. universities, in some cases forged when you were students together or postdocs together or something that come from some of these kinds of relationships. What are the barriers that are in place to being able to, put, to make that work, make all those kinds of partnerships work better? Uh, we have a set of recommendations that we are aiming at the uh, federal policy makers and the funding agencies. And the, the whole question about when partnerships occur, how can our funding agencies best ensure the, the, the success of those partnerships? Uh, for example, our colleagues at Fogarty will fund, will support the funding for people f who are from the emerging science partner country. But our colleagues at NSF, they don't do that. And so th in some cases you may be able to have the, the work facilitated by just in terms of the way that the agencies behave and the decisions that they make. We have a set of recommendations that are aimed at our scientific societies. Our scientific societies not only publish the journals, but they also have meetings. They have opportunities for people to be able to present their issues within these meetings. What could those societies do to provide a platform that would allow for the explication of some of the issues that you have been raising here? How do we begin to bring young people, for example, into these kinds of meetings early on or early enough that they can begin to network and come to know people and come to build uh, uh, connections to people who may be doing similar work or people from whom they, uh, they might be able to learn new techniques or, or gain insights. And then finally, there are recommendations that are uh, directed at uh, US-based foundations and companies. Our foundation community has been incredibly active uh, in many of your countries. And therefore, what is it that we need to say to about the way that they support the research or the work or the partnerships? And so these are some of the things that we want to, to look at. This has been a really, really quick overview of how we got to this point. This is only one stop on kind of a worldwide tour because we want to ask these questions in other regions of the world. The regions, the issues here are maybe different from the issues in Southeast Asia or different from the issues in Latin America. And we want to understand how generalizable the things are that we have said here. 
So I'm going to turn to one of our um, uh, fellow working group members, uh, Akeem Kamba, from the University of Michigan. But uh, in his case, he's going to talk about a project that is actually on the bigger end, but still is situated in the region. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Kim Kumba, originally from the Cameroons, and I'm at the University of Michigan, and also a senior fellow with the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. And uh, just to put a little bit of context to what our colleague Shelley was mentioning earlier, uh, being an African working in the U.S., I do have the opportunity to stride both sides all often. And uh, the U.S. being a giant in the scientific enterprise globally, in every aspect of the world, funding, infrastructure, personnel, you name it, policy, you name it, they have an interest in strengthening their links to the rest of the world. And the question that uh, some of us want to ask on the Africa side, if you flip the coin, is for, for, for us on the, on, the, on the continent here, if we were to partner with U.S. colleagues or institutions, what kind of things would we look at U.S. policy people, funders, scientists doing that we can make suggestions on how things can get better for both parties to proceed to, uh, to, to do well. So while the uh, work we're doing is from uh, the American Academy of Arts and Science, we do want to know from uh, the various partners, please do well to when working on uh, these questionnaires, flip the coin knowing that you have partners over there and uh, they're not going to fund everything that everybody wants to do. They're not going to provide development aid for everybody. They're not a Britain Woods institution to do everything and answer every question. But as scientists with whom you cooperate with colleagues over there, what kind of recommendations and suggestions or just ideas can you provide that would strengthen both the quality and the outcome of such uh, collaborations. Now, in working with this, one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges to to uh, working with U.S. or Northern country scientists, for example, is infrastructure. Infrastructure, laboratories. We see the uh, excitement around the work of the Ghana Atomic Energy. That's just one for a country. Currently, South Africa is the one with the largest infrastructure on the continent, the SKA, Square Kilometer Array, which is uh, still up and coming, but promises to provide lots of uh, support, not only to astronomy and astrophysics, but to all the other areas that data analysis and the science that come out of that big facility can provide. Now, we have been working for the last five years or so to consider Africa being a home to a light source, an equivalent of uh, the system project in the Middle East. Africa currently is the only continent without a light source facility. It's a major engage, um, endeavor. A light source costs about a billion dollars to, uh, to establish, and maybe uh, up to, what, $100, $200 million to operate annually. And, and uh, that's just one aspect, financial. It also needs manpower to run it, technical expertise at the best level to even consider something like that. So a few colleagues, for physicists from South Africa, the US, Europe, the diaspora, quite a good consortium, about 50 of them, have been working over the last five years to make the case to both their governments on the continent and the national partners uh, that uh, it's about time if Africa would do this kind of partnerships in a more equitable way with the developed world, then they need the infrastructure, otherwise it's always going to be unbalanced. The, the receiving side would always be the one that provides the data and, you know, it would be a big brother, younger brother relationship. Mutuality in research, in partnerships, requires some kind of strengthening of your own base. And so uh, we're thinking that uh, the light source would, one, provide, uh, make Africa the home of frontier science, of big science, so that big researchers abroad can also come to Africa to work on our facilities, just the way Sesame has become the home of or CERN or ESSR or all the other light sources are home to big time scientists across the world, become consortium. 
an African light source will not be for Africans alone. It will be an international scientific facility on the continent. We've had uh, two major conferences in that, in that, in that uh, regard. The last one was right here in Accra in January. And fortuitously, President Akufo Addo was present and did endorse it and think that he would be a champion on the continent to push the agenda through the African Union as a Pan-African facility because no one country can do that. If you look at African GDPs, African policy, uh, politics, and mechanism for funding, a billion dollars is not chump change. So uh, the idea is to bring together especially a consortium of willing African countries and those who quote unquote fund science in Africa to not only phone Africa as the receiver of what is created outside, but also from Africa as that which can produce frontier science. And so in working on the challenges for international partnerships, we think that such a facility would be one good area to look at, to strengthen the African base and make partnerships and partnerships a little, a little more mutualizing. Than, uh, than it is uh, today. The next meeting on that con in that uh, in that work would be um, July, uh, November 16th of next year in Kigali, in Rwanda. We want to encourage the academics to be part of it to help us. We are physicists. You are the leaders with the scientific community. The scientific African scientific community is in your hands. What we do well or don't do well is our impact on your on your community and your work as well. So we're good to consider uh, partnering, participating. The African Academy of Science in out of uh, out of uh, Nairobi, and a few other academies are already uh, working with us. Many other light source facilities across the world. The ESFR, Alba in uh, Spain, and there's a new one coming up, coming up in. Um, in Mexico, they are all uh, interested in working with us on this. We are establishing an MOU with Sesame to look at their model and maybe uh, see if they can provide a beamline of their resources for African scientists to build the capacity that can be used back home when the time arises. So it's work in progress, but it's, uh, and there's plenty to talk about it. We've already worked with the Association of African Universities to see how the university establishment can be part of this. After all, the science will be done for their students and their staff and, and uh, university work. So uh, the light source is something that uh, we think can be a token component of uh, how uh, countries that are less scientifically advanced can strengthen themselves to elevate their work for a little more parity with the, those that are more advanced like the U.S. and may provide more mutuality when the U.S. partners like this come asking how can we work better. We can say, well, we have something that, you know, can also be a use to you. So, Thank you. Let me just make uh, one little uh, correction to what was said uh, earlier in the introduction. Not you. I, I'm not a light source person. Uh, and that was, uh, a, we would love to take credit for it, but uh, actually the seed funding came through the National Academies and the, um, through the, the Gates funding. However, we have appropriated Bruce Alberts onto our group uh, because when Bruce was the leader uh, of that effort, but at that time, uh, it was an important issue to get this these academies started. But now that we have you, there is the opportunity to learn from you what would it take to be to provide better partnerships and Bruce is an enthusiastic uh, player here because he sees that this is kind of a next step you establish but then how do we begin to draw uh, the advice from you or how about how best to situate uh, partnerships with the US okay we need to be better partners I'll say that from the beginning and we, I would like to put us into, to spend some time in table groups where you share your experiences with each other and then have a, a reporter and we will come around and actually report some of your experiences. And we want to hear the bad stuff too. We want to hear the good stuff. That would be wonderful because that would give us some ideas about what success looks like in a partnership. But we also want to hear the bad stuff. 
uh, and I think that there's nothing that you could say that's probably any worse than what I have said because we have not always been the best partners. And so we're trying to really understand so that we can direct uh, recommendations, observations to the right places uh, within, the, within the U.S. as we really try to become uh, much better at this business of international So stop and ask if there are any questions. We are at near the beginning of our project. We have more listening sessions that we want to do uh, in other places in the world as we are formulating these reports. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm Suad Suleiman from the Sudanese National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the ASADE program supported a few of the academies in Africa to build capacity. So most of the other African academies, they still need capacity building. Are you going to do um, phase two of ASADE? Specifically because we as Sudanese, we did not benefit from the ASADE except very minimal, other than the meetings with NASAC and so on. So we would like very much to have a chance of support from um, American side to build the capacity of our academy because we now that the Sudan is stepping into a new phase and uh, it is open up for more collaborative work, but the academy needs to be supported and strengthened in a way that it can, be, it can have the capacity to address and to receive all this opening up. Thank you for that. I think that we want to hear about these kinds of larger organizational needs of the academies, but we also want to hear about how this works and plays out within your institutions and your own interactions as researchers and what you have encountered uh, as well. But that is a that's a perfectly legitimate question to raise about this whole issue of organizational capacity. And we know that capacity building is a continual challenge uh, with, with regard to science. I'll get you while I'm on my way. Huh? <laughs> you think, uh, it's good. Um, uh, when we talk about a partnership, for me, it's around a subject. For example, uh, research, uh, spe field or specific research. It can be specific research. And uh, usually each country have, in con each country in Africa has different. And each country have some priorities. And this is very important. If you haven't in the priorities of the country, you will not, uh, because we will have partnership, but it is important to have help of our country. And for that, I think we have to discuss to see what we can do. It's not easy. And um, or another thing in Africa, there is a specific for each country is different from the other. It's like all the country. And sometimes it is not easy. And it is important that we also have partnerships, close partnership between each country in Africa. And this we haven't yet. We have a little. For example, between Francophone, between Anglophone, there is also a barrier between them. It's the language and it's important. Thank you. Let me just say that uh, we really are trying to take, I'm going to come over there next, but take a regional approach. We do not want to just say, well, with this country or that country, the other country. We really are looking at the region because you have created a structure here to be able to interact with each other. And, we're, and if that is the best way to support the, any kind of partnership within the U.S., that needs to be said. Yeah, I think I hear what you say very well, and I want to comment on that. So within the continent, there are, there are, there are variations, I mean, disparities. But ask yourself, for example, 
if you are in Cameroon and you're never in a country in Nigeria, you want to improve scientific uh, partnerships between those two countries. What recommendations would you make to both countries either way? Within Africa itself, as a consortium of our academies here, I'm sure the question comes up all, all, all the time. How do different countries better work with each other? But even more importantly, now you have the continental free trade area. That says mobility of people and resources and everything with a vision towards doing as a continent. And now you walk as a continent and look at the US and say, okay, for this specific conversation here, there are broad varieties that can take us to many directions and many countries. But for this specific conversation, this next couple of minutes, how does if Africa, African scientific leaders here present, looking at the US as a potential one block with science, with lots of activities with African partners. How does that partnership get improved? What kind of recommendations can enable the US side to improve its way of working with partners so that there are better outcomes? Okay, I promised next here. And I will say, let me remind you that the the U.S. is not a monolith in terms of our institutions. We have really well-off institutions and really quite poor institutions, but that are doing a wonderful job of capacity building. Yeah, thank you. I know I taught at the University of Michigan where you're teaching, but around there also there are some poor schools in Detroit. So she's right. Uh, but uh, it is good that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been pitching in with NASAC and with the academies. And I think um, if I had to, to push a bit of my wish, <clears throat> maybe it would be duofold. Um, already it has been part of it has been mentioned, the, 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 the challenges that we have here regionally in Africa, um, they, they are common in most cases. And so they need a common approach in strategy. But then when it comes to action, because these challenges are everywhere they need to be dealt with locally and so it's 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 a case of we need to be able to think globally but act locally so i'll give an example yes. um this morning 